The city is probably the oldest, most enduring invention of our civilization. The words are interchangeable. Civilization, civil, civic, city. Cities evolve over time. They respond to crises. And historically, they emerge from crises stronger than ever before. So what are the future trends for cities? And what are the lessons of history? Hello, I'm Robin Chase. I've co-founded Zipcar, several other transportation companies, and most recently Numo, a, my first nonprofit. I'm gonna to talk today about the future of tr urban transport and try to give context for where we are today and how that's gonna play forward in the future. The future of urban transportation, I know for sure is going to be multimodal. And I don't even have to be very clever when I say that because number one, because of climate change is going to be sustainable for sure. And as we all move into cities, they're very dense. We can't have that, I, that thing we used to have, which was one car per adult or one car per household. It's necessarily gonna be multimodal. And I've got here that it's gonna be cars, public and shared transport, and this third thing I wanna talk about called no and low cost and unlicensed networks. I think of it, this is the freedom network. So I'm gonna talk about these three things today and do a little bit more heavily on things that, you, that are less obvious to you. So I wanna start with this idea that infrastructure is destiny. This is an idea that my husband gave to me and it is so profoundly true. And let me unpack that. If we look at Levittown in the United States, built in the late forties, the idea of having these single family houses distributed out there in the farmland. And then we built the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. When we had these two pieces of infrastructure, positively, that gave us the destiny of congestion and obesity in America. The one plus the other just directly gave us this situation. So infrastructure is destiny. If I think about this idea, we can also look at in the Netherlands where they've had 40 years of cycle friendly infrastructure building. And you can see that the Dutch cycle at 16 times what we cycle in America and have a dramatically lower obesity rate. So infrastructure is destiny. I think a lot about what are different kinds of infrastructure. And I think about our human nature as personal infrastructure. And so what I know about our human nature is that we strongly favor convenience, and things that are cheap. So anything that's easy and cheap, that's what we go for. And I would recommend that you read a book by Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, that pulls forward this idea that we as humans, inside of us, we just wanna do the cheap and easy thing. What is important for today is that over the last hundred years, we have specifically and proactively made personal cars the easy and cheap choice. You know, we've underpriced air pollution, you don't have to pay for congestion, mostly curb access and metro areas is free. And we have in most countries really underpriced how to pay for, for transportation infrastructure, particularly in America where our fuel fees are really, really low. So with market pricing misaligned, we totally overconsumed car travel. And I think of this as our tax and regulatory, our economic infrastructure. This is kind of built in and we all respond to this underpricing. And then of course, I need to touch on the most important piece of our infrastructure, our planetary infrastructure. And we are now headed towards calamity, as you know, and we really want to top out at one and a half degrees centigrade of warming so we can protect some low lying countries. But doing what we're doing today, we're on tap to go towards four to six degrees of warming, which is really um, calamitous. It's an existential crisis, meaning we will not exist. And it really is the thrust of all of my work. And I hope that you all take it very seriously. And again, infrastructure is destiny. If we don't deal with this issue, we know where we're going. And so infrastructure is destiny. Our planetary infrastructure is probably our single most important thing to be thinking about. So in urban transportation systems, they're horrific. Um, so 23% of global CO2 emissions come from the transport sector. Um, number one, car, car accidents are the number one killer of people between the age of five and 29. That's 1.3 million deaths every year. 
And I just want to sit on that for a minute. Those are the deaths. It's something like 10 times that number are involved in car accidents. So it is a horrific public health issue. And what is really striking to me is that 32% of household income is spent on transportation for those poorest among us. On average, households spend around 13 to 17% of their income on cars. And as I say, this, this poorest quintile is 32% of their income. And when you think about that, if you can only get to your job with a car, it's your first dollar that you spend on this rather than food, housing, education, because you need to get those other dollars. So when we have a car centric transportation system, which is what we basically have in most countries in the world, we put this huge burden that's added to the rest of our lives. The good news is I think of this is that, I think of transportation is like tectonic plates in motion. Everything is in flux. It's this kind of big soup of innovation right now that's happening. And this innovation is stressing existing business models and existing regulations and existing revenue streams. And it's provoking this total reevaluation of the status quo. And how do I feel about that? Yes, like, how fantastic if ever there was a moment when we needed to be able to reevaluate what we're doing and have these huge stressors, it is now. And so I'm delighted that we're having conversations in every city and every country in the world around new technologies that are entering the market because that's forcing us to reevaluate what's going on. It gives us this opportunity. So most of my career over the last 20 years has been really looking at transportation innovation and building those companies. So what I know about these new innovations is that it's technology that has made sharing easy. It's technology that made car sharing and Zipcar possible that before you, there was no way that you could imagine renting a car by the hour when you have because of all those transaction costs and you don't have technology to find the car, pay for the car, get into the car in a snap. You just can't do it without technology. Similarly, I think about tech transit apps that are multimodal and mean I can take a bus in London or you know, take the metro in Buenos Aires. The only reason I can do that is because I now have an app that tells me here's where you find it, here's how you pay for it, here's where you get off. And the whole rise of e-hailing and ride sharing, again, it is, it's only possible when we've reduced the transaction costs with technology. I can find someone who's going my way. Otherwise, I couldn't find those people. It was too hard when we had you know, messenger boards. Um, if you look at this picture, so here's what I'm thinking about the future. I think the future is gonna be largely a huge number of micromobility and specifically e-scooters and e-bikes. And this picture is so delightful. This is. 1900 New York City, an electric scooter. It's like, what a great photo. But while you're looking at the foreground, I want you to look in the background and look in the background. New York City is not yet in 19, I think it's 1907, completely jammed full with cars. We haven't yet made that choice and you know the direction that we chose back then. And here, I think that the future is gonna be about 50% of the trips we take will be in these micro vehicles. And here's a suite of them. You know, you can be sitting on an e-scooter, you can be disabled on an e-scooter, you can be old, you can be young. And what's really great about them is that they are very space efficient, fuel efficient, and you get to where you wanna go. So what's remarkable when I think about the opportunity for this micromobility is that 52% of trips in the US are shorter than three miles. And in fact, I think that's a number that's very close to what it is around the world. So about 50% of trips are less than five kilometers or three miles. What we know about those trips is that 73% of them are done by car. It's just crazy to me. It's a short trip and it's done by car. And why is it done by car? Because we can look back and if we look in the last hundred years, while we've made it simple, cheap, and easy and convenient for cars, we've made it safer to cross the ocean than to cross the street. Now, when back a hundred years ago, I would have looked at this, this is Starro Drive in Boston. I could have crossed the street. I could have had my eight-year-old cross the street. I could have taken a bike without thinking I was gonna kill myself. Today, that street is eight lanes of traffic and it's death defined to cross the street. And I'm just really struck by this idea that we have 
taken what used to be freedom of a kind of an assumed and a given freedom of mobility that we could get to where we wanted to go on our own two feet. And now a hundred years later with this inflow of cars and car infrastructure, that is no longer the case. I no longer can cross the street and go places safely without a car. And so we need to be able to rework our infrastructure, which is our destiny. We need to rework that infrastructure so that we can shift those 50% of short trips to make them possible in what we call active modes by bike or micro mobility or by foot safely. Um, I wanna go into another place and then come back. So technology has also made on-demand consumption and delivery easy and convenient. And I think, yay, that's really great news, but it has these horrific consequences for city retail and streets and curb use. So if we don't have any retail stores on streets, what's it gonna be like to walk down the street? And if everything is being delivered to our door by delivery vans, what kind of pressure does that put on our streets, a huge amount of double parking. London is famously congested by double parking, not by other things. Um, I had this picture of the Amazon truck, you know, what you want before you want it. That's a kind of creepy sentence if you think about it. <laughs> and, and that is the case today that Amazon actually knows what I wanna buy before I bought it. Um, I just put up here a new graph that I pulled up last night looking at how COVID has accelerated the shift to online retail. I'd already been very worried about the impact of online retail to our urban environment. And you can see that in 2020, it went from 13% of retail sales to 16%. And so people talk about how COVID advanced on-demand shopping by three years. And while it sounds like 16% isn't very much, when they talk about online, re when they talk about retail as a whole, they're talking about things like cars, which you wouldn't be buying online or this whole range of things. So for things that can be bought online, so small consumer goods and food, it has really shifted enormously to online. And so we are now witnessing what does that look like on our streets? And I think for, for architects, we know that already in the last two or three years, grocery stores and restaurants have been redesigned to have a larger space allocated to um, pickup and delivery aspects. And so it's really shaping, reshaping how we build inside stores and the curbside and parking and what that looks like. And I really want you guys to think about what does that look like and feel like for people who live in cities and wanna get around. Another thing I want to talk about is, is if we around this online shopping, if we think about today, today's retail and urban environments, you want to be along the main street and all the shops are on the main street and that's where the highest rents are, but that's where you want to be because where everyone's walking. And if you don't have a lot of money, you might've bought your store, you're renting your store on a side street. And now we have the rise of these suburban warehouses. If I look to the future and I think about the rise of autonomous vehicles. And I feel like on-demand shopping is very much like autonomous vehicles. You suddenly have, I want to call them rats, retail automated trips. All of those stores no longer need to have a physical presence. They will be warehoused. Their inventory will be on delivery trucks running around our city. So all of those inventories that were housed in retail, where I would get to go and browse myself through that inventory is now stored in these distant warehouses and those inventories are cruising our streets. And I think about this for me is my urban nightmare. And why is this possible? Because I let people drive for free on my city streets and it's way cheaper than paying for rent. And so if I think about this for me, it's just like welcome to hell. And I just want to point out that we think about rats in cities as bad, but rats in the countryside, we're probably okay with that. And so whenever I'm thinking about autonomous vehicle policy, um, density really matters when I think about this. But as you think about and promote and you personally shop online, really consider what is it doing to your urban fabric. And when you're when we are too lazy to walk three blocks to go buy toilet paper and from the local store and have it delivered to us, 
that really transforms what our cities are gonna look like. So because of this huge transformation that's happening in the transport environment, I do a lot of work with cities and with countries and with um, transportation companies. And what I recognized is that the cities are pissed off at these new transportation innovations and they say they're ruining our cities. And then the startups and these transportation companies are saying, wait up, the cities don't even know what they want and they certainly haven't communicated it to us. So a couple of years ago, I worked with 10 of the largest, world's largest NGOs. And together over seven months, we put together something called the shared mobility principles. So we would have a shared vision for what is good for cities and the people who live in them and companies working in those cities. And today we've had a couple hundred companies, large and small, sign on to this and many cities sign on to this. And I wanna point out a few of them. And I would reference you guys to this sharedmobilityprinciples.org. But if you look at number one, it is exactly on topic for you. We must plan our cities and mobility together. When you build, when you build a piece of housing or retail or office building, how are people gonna get there? Right now, those two are two separate discussions and we need those discussions to be together so we can make much more efficient use of our, of our transportation system and make it easier for people to get around. Um, number two, focus on moving people, not cars. Yes, our goal in life is not to make it easy for cars to park and to get around. Our goal should be how do people move and get around and get the things they need. So I'm gonna pull out just a few of these. What if instead of building brand new expanded highways, because we're always saying it's congested, we made efficient use of lanes, vehicles, and curbs. This is shared mobility principle number three. And I wanted to show you, this is a really famous in the transportation sector. There are many, many versions of this photo. So here are 200 people and 177 cars. This photo happens to be taken in Seattle, but there's another version that was taken in Italy. And so you are transportation planner and you're saying, oh my God, look at all that traffic. It is completely congested. And I've already taken out all the on-street parking. I've already made it one way. I've got absolutely maximum number of cars as I can get in there. So look, this is what it is in terms of humans. This is statistically representative of how many people are in those cars. Right now, 70% of all cars have one human in them. So I just wanna go back so you can really appreciate the drama of this. Here we are, congestion jammed wall to wall. And in many cities they say, oh my God, let's build a highway on top of that highway, right? So you can think of many, many cities, Mexico City among them, Cairo, where they built a, you know, the second layer to accommodate all those people when in fact, this is what it looks like. So we really need to think about making efficient use of our lanes. And um, here is an example of that. And I feel like this photo is already out of date. This is Market Street in San Francisco. It used to be six lanes of car traffic moving people. And then about five years ago, they said, nope, we're going to think about moving people, not cars. And they made the center two lanes for public transit and they pushed through 60 people per lane block. Then they made the next lane here, bicycle lanes and they moved 40 people per lane block. And then in the outermost lanes, which are for cars, which used to be, remember, all six lanes, now there's just two of them, you're moving 12 people per lane block. And about six months ago, Market Street converted over and they just took out all the car lanes. So now they really are maximizing the making efficient use of space and assets and moving people, not cars. And so they've just gotten rid of the cars because in fact, cars are the most inefficient use of space in these dense urban areas for moving humans. So here's another one. What if we had fair user fees across all modes? I think of this as the tax infrastructure. This is, this is a famous um, piece of research that was done by Discourse Media. Um, if walking costs you a dollar, society pays a penny. If biking costs a dollar, society pays eight cents. If busing costs a dollar, society pays a dollar fifty. If driving costs you a dollar, society pays $9.20. So imagine if you were actually paying the real costs for congestion, for air quality, for expensive places to park your car outside your house or retail in urban areas. Would you ever choose to drive when it's $9.20?
is nine times what you are actually paying today? No, we wouldn't. We would be thinking about these other options. And I want to be clear, I don't hate cars. I talk about the fact that we need to be multimodal, which means when I'm with my 95 year old mother who has broken her leg and we want to go 20 miles, yes, let's get a car. Absolutely need a car. When you're carrying heavy objects and lots of them, get a car. But most of the time we're moving around by ourselves or with a child in tow. And we can really, we don't really need to be using these big cars. So here's an example from San Francisco. It's $110 fine for illegally parking a car. And there you see this as a cyclist I see all the time, you know, somebody double parked in the car lane. So $110 for illegally parked car, $500 for illegally parked scooter. That's not fair user fees across all modes. And why did the city do that? The city said, oh, e-scooters are run by big venture capital backed companies. We're gonna charge them a lot. But I'm a user, I'm the one who's gonna be paying that fee. And so do I, which is, which is worse. And so this is not fair user fees across all modes. So if I think about the future of transportation, I wanna go back to where I started. It's going to be multimodal. And when I started this, this talk, I put cars first because that's what's in everyone's brains. Cars first and public transport second. But now I wanna say, wait up, I wanna push this new thing to be the top of your mind, this network that I'm calling a freedom network that makes it possible for no and low cost travel and unlicensed travel as in, I don't need a driver's license. I can go out my front door as a eight year old or as a person who has lost their license because they were driving drunk or a person who doesn't have a car or a person who has a car in their household and the car's out. We, this, is a, this is a group of people that's totally, totally lost. And we need to bring that group of people back up into the four. And as I've looked into it, it's about 50% of the population at any given moment either doesn't have a driver's license or doesn't have access to a car at this minute. And right now, as I pointed out, it's unsafe to cross these streets and it's easier, as I say, to be flying to London or Milan. So I'm really bad at telling jokes, but this one now I can read. So a driver, cyclist and pedestrian walk into a bar. There are 12 cookies. The driver takes 10 cookies and says to the pedestrian, watch out or the cyclist will take your cookie. <laughs> That's what's happening in cities today. We have just so given over everything to cars that pedestrians and cyclists are eating the crumbs off the floor. And many cities, so Paris and London among them and Barcelona have been doing this phenomenal job of recalibrating what's on that plate and who's, who's, who's getting the cookies on the plate. So at any given moment, 180 million people in America can't get behind the wheel of a car. And I would suggest it's this number. It's about 50% of the population in every single city. And who are these people? These are people who don't have a driver's license, don't have a car, or don't have enough money to pay for that. And again, who are those people? 20% are younger than 16. That's probably what came into your mind. But did you know that 18% of the population is physically impaired and will never get a driver's license? Um, in the US, across the whole country, 9% of the households don't have cars and 7 million licenses have been suspended for different kinds of infractions, maybe um, dangerous driving or sometimes non-payment of fines. So this huge number of people. Um, when I look at those statistics, I'm asking, and when you guys look at those statistics, statistics, I want you to do an extra step of digging deeper and thinking about this issue of equity and systemic racism. And in the US, the systemic racism is targeted at black and people of color, but in other countries, it's often indigenous people and, and sometimes black people. So I, I want you to look a little deeper. So if I go to the statistics I just talked about, when our transportation policy relies on car access alone, and we say, oh, 8% of US households don't have access to a car. But if I look at that closely, it's 4.6% of white households that don't have cars, but 19% of black houses that, are, that don't have cars. So you can't say, oh, it's this small percentage of people, I'm not gonna care about them. No, it's 19% of black households don't have cars. So we are building a car dependent infrastructure that completely sucks for them. And so when we choose to underfund public transit, we say, oh, only 5% of Americans use transit to get to work, but 23% of black people use transit all the time and 28% of all US essential workers need to ride public transit. 
and 29% of those essential workers are black. And so then we also think about our car, these are just car regulations, which is incredible. So the impact of people outside of cars, right now, 20% of all traffic fatalities in the US are pedestrian and cyclist, but black pedestrians are killed at twice the rate of whites and black cyclists are killed at almost twice the rate. rate. And so just as you guys think about these things, I want, you, I want to pull it into the front of your minds that different populations are being treated differently and have different and we, we appear to have cared about them differently and we really need to change that. So when we think about street safety, what might seem like not important to you could be incredibly important to people of different races. So I'm just coming to a close now. When I think about building this freedom network, it gives joy. I wanna say we really need to put the joy back in movement in cities and, and across our countries. Um, closing, if I think about our mobility future, we really have this choice that is a proactive choice to make. If we sit in the status quo and move forward with the status quo, we will continue and perpetuate with the existing bad infrastructure that will deliver us massive sprawl and single occupancy vehicles and pollution and unsafe streets and deliver unjust and unsustainable cities. Or we have to actually work really hard, change our infrastructure, which means our tax infrastructure, our roadside infrastructure, our housing code infrastructure, our development infrastructure, our systemic racism infrastructure, and build what I think of as heaven, compact and accessible cities, shared modes, decarbonize, complete streets, and build these sustainable, just, and livable cities that are just so much better than the status quo. This is where we wanna be going. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. I hope I've given you a whirlwind tour of um, some past and future of transportation. Mm -hmm.